So I do want to make sure that I thank our uh, our supporters, our collaborators. So this um, series is brought to you by uh, a SARE grant, a Northeast SARE grant, which is a partnership between UMass, that's uh, Masood Hashemi, UMaine with Rick Kersberg and our previous speaker, and today Heather Darby with UVM. And Masood uh, informed me yesterday, which was news to me, that there is some stipend funding in the grant to support farmers on farm that want to pilot some of these different alternative forage production methods that we are including in this summer series. So whether that's summer annuals or cool season annuals or stockpiling, uh, if that's something you want to try on farm, there is a little bit of stipend money. So you can go ahead and get in touch with me. My email is in all the registration links and I will put you in touch with the right person. I also want to make sure that I thank the Livestock Institute of Southern New England. They are a partner of the recently formed New England Grazing Network, which is being developed across New England with a variety of grazing professionals and farmers. And they are providing the administrative support for this series. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather Darby. She is truly the type of person that needs no introduction, um, but I'll give her one anyways. Uh, Heather is uh, extension faculty at the University of Vermont, works very extensively with, with UVM Extension, and she's one of those people that just knows something about everything from malting barley to all things grazing to hemp, uh, soil health. So I'm really excited to have her as a presenter today. And with that, Heather, I am going to make you our presenter and you can take it away. All right, can you hear me, Sam? Sure can. All right, that's great. That's a good first step. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> All right, and now I'm going to um, put my presentation up. Can you see that? Yes, we can. All right, then I will, um, I'll get going from here. So thank you for the introduction. And I believe our, our last speaker, Rick Kurzbergen, talked about summer annuals. Um, and today we're going to really focus on cool season annual forages and uh, really try to get a bit into the nuts and bolts about uh, what to grow, when to get planning, some of those logistical pieces, and then a little more information on you know, yields and quality and how to utilize those in a cropping system. Um, and I did go through some of the questions or all the questions and hopefully uh, we'll be able to answer most of those. And if not, like Sam said, we can uh, make sure that we do get those answered by someone that may know more um, about that topic than we do. All right, so let's get started. So one of the reasons we want to even consider annuals, I mean, New England in general is just a great place to grow perennials, perennial cool season um, forages, you know, our grasses and our legumes, but there certainly are opportunities and I would say increasing need to consider um, some of uh, these annual forages um, to integrate them into both our stored feed system, but also our grazing systems. Um, you know, many of these annuals are drought tolerant, which certainly has been an issue this year, or more cold tolerant than our perennial forages, and they can also fill gaps um, in feed. So, you know, like the summer slump, the severe summer slump that we're going through right now. Um, they also tend to be really high biomass, and in some cases, much higher biomass than our perennial forages, and they can be pretty flexible, too, uh, multi-purpose, you know, so they can be grazed. Um, if you don't get to graze them all, or maybe they get by you, you can use them for silage or baleage. Um, and then, of course, they can also be taken um, to full maturity for grain or seed and, and bedding, all kinds of uses. So... They can be a good investment and a good fit on some farms, although, you know, not every farm. Um, so, you know, right now, this year in particular, we've been going through a pretty severe drought, at least up here in Vermont and most places. Um, but, you know, in general, we do see low productivity of cool season forages in the summer. Um, they pick up in the fall. Okay, so you can see this blue line here shows them declining in the summer, but then picking up in productivity in the fall. 
but they really don't reach um, the same production that they have in the spring. And so growing cool season annuals can help really supplement um, the cool season perennials in the fall and also provide a, a higher quality feed. Usually the quality of the perennials in the fall um, is much lower than it is in the spring. Um, one of the other reasons we're really starting to focus on some of these annuals to supplement our perennials is because we are seeing pretty significant changes in, in our climate. And one of you know, the changes we're seeing, although not apparently this year, is more precipitation. And the Northeast is seeing this um, to a greater extent than any place else. Um, and so this really kind of extreme precipitation is, is wreaking havoc a bit on our perennial forages. Um, causing damage oftentimes when it's too wet to be grazing. And so having some annuals to supplement again can be really important. Um, this is some data from Alberg from our research farm. And again, I, I just wanted to show this to highlight why we're really starting to focus more on these annuals. So the yellow, or I'm sorry, the blue line here, the light blue line through the middle is our 30-year normal, <laughs> whatever that is anymore. Um, and then you can see this um, 2017 to 2020. And basically, we have two years that were above normal in precipitation and two years below normal in precipitation, um, not even really hitting that 30-year normal line here over the last four years. And I think, again, this is just really causing a lot of stress in our perennial forages, but creating opportunities for us to use these annuals. Um, and again, this is from this year. You can see that, you know, we're in a drought. I'm sure if you're living here, you know that. If you're trying to grow perennial uh, forages, they're suffering. Um, I know ours are here in Vermont. We just um, haven't had rain, much rain at all. And those perennial cool season forages are, are not growing back. Um, and people are having to take animals off from pasture. And so we really need something um, this fall <laughs> to, um, to improve the feed quality. So it's a great time to be considering uh, cool season annuals. I've gotten lots of calls from farmers that are really stressed out about having enough winter feed uh, having to dip into that stored feed right now to feed animals that should be out on pasture. So getting geared up to plant a cool season annual could really help you save some of that stored feed so you're not using it for this winter. So here's a graph probably many people have seen showing our perennial pasture, again, productivity, and you can see this green line kind of peaking, going down, semi-peaking again, and going back down into November. And then you can see here this purple and blue lines um, where we have opportunities to grow cool season annuals and produce more biomass and um, also higher quality feed than we would see from our perennial pastures. Okay. So what are the cool season annuals that I'm talking about and when do we plant them and what seeding rates? That's what we're going to talk about now. So cool season annuals that we would be gearing up to plant in many cases in the next couple of weeks <laughs> include small grains or cereal grains, um, some grasses like annual ryegrass, different brassicas like kale, turnips, radish, tillage radishes, um, and possibly legumes. Um, in particular, for an annual, we have been using uh, forage peas as a uh, cool season annual, but there are some other options as well. Okay, so we have small grains. You have to kind of consider spring or winter, um, and then annual ryegrass which is very closely related to like perennial ryegrass, the brassicas and the legumes. All right, so when we talk about um, 
cereal grains. Most people in our region are used to planting winter rye. And it's generally planted for many of us in late September into October as a cover crop. And winter rye, winter wheat, winter triticale, and winter barley are all grains, small cereal grains, that, as the name implies, will overwinter and survive, in most places, um, the next spring. Now, what they don't really do is produce a lot, in general, a lot of biomass in the fall. Their goal in the fall is to get established, produce a few, few tillers, and then get go dormant until the next spring, okay? So if you go ahead and plant one of the winter cereal grains for grazing this October, you might be disappointed in the amount of productivity, the amount of biomass that's there. They don't generally produce a lot of biomass and height um, going into the fall, okay? So if you're really focused on growing something to have this October or November, then really you're going to want to produce a spring grain or you're going to want to seed a spring grain. And by far, oats are the cereal grain that will produce the most biomass and the best quality for fall grazing, all right? If you're looking for a annual to overwinter and have for grazing the next spring, then you would want to use winter wheat or winter rye, winter triticale um, as your choice. Okay, and we'll talk about mixing these up if we have time. Okay, so again, if you're planting cereal grains and you want something this fall with a lot of biomass, then really you should be choosing oats. Um, otherwise, the grains will produce some biomass, it won't be as much, um, and it should regrow the next spring as well if there's not too much damage from grazing, okay? So here you can see in the little graph down below, rye, triticale, and wheat, and this is the dry matter tons that were produced the next spring, okay? So that's when you get the tonnage on winter grains. The oats will winter kill, at least in Vermont and most of New England. Um, and again, that you're going to get your primary production out of those for grazing this fall. All right. So annual ryegrass and forage peas are two other annuals that um, are really good quality. Um, annual ryegrass itself is more like a perennial cool season forage, at least in how it looks and grows, and can also produce a good amount of biomass in the fall. So for grasses, I would say your primary bet is to select oats or annual ryegrass to have fall production of feed. If you mix in some triticale or some rye, you won't get a lot of growth out of it for this fall for grazing, but there'll be something there. And if it's not grazed too heavy and damaged, it will overwinter and maybe provide some early spring grazing as well. All right, so let's talk about establishment. Now, if you're um, trying to to hay this especially, if you want to take some of this for stored feed too, a grain drill is going to work the best. Um, it'll work the best no matter what you're doing because you get better seed to soil contact, um, more even depth of planting, so you'll get better germination. We have been dry. We are getting a little bit of rain now, but we have been dry. So being able to um, plant the seed relatively deep with a grain drill may give you more moisture um, to get germination this late summer. But you can broadcast. If you do broadcast, my recommendation is to incorporate the seed afterwards. Don't just broadcast it on top of the soil. Um, people ask about no-till and 
No till into an established sod is risky. You may get something, but you're not going to get a lot. Um, if you've worked the ground or you have an area that um, was in an annual, you certainly can no-till into that and get a decent stand. So when do we want to plant these? For us up here in northern Vermont, in order to have grazing at the end of September into October and maybe into November, they need to be planted ideally by the third week of August. So this is like many other crops, right? So if you're planting a new seeding of perennial forages, usually you're harvesting the first cutting around 40 days later. So this is not any different. <laughs> you need about 30 to 40 days and depending on the weather, maybe 50, to get the amount of biomass to make it worthwhile to graze, okay? So for us, you know, the third week of August will bring us into the really the beginning of October, usually the second week of October, when we would be harvesting these annuals, and that's about um, 40 days, okay? And again, it really depends on the weather. Like, we have had no moisture, so if you plant um, and you have limited moisture, it's going to take a while for them to come out of the ground. If you have a lot of moisture, but then it gets really cold in September, they're going to grow more slowly. So you really need to plan to have enough time for these to grow, considering that it could get pretty cold um, in September and October. Okay, so be planning for it to take, again, about 40, maybe 50 days before you can graze. All right, so that's why we're having this webinar now, <laughs> so that you can uh, get prepared. All right, planting depth. Really, uh, most of these species can be planted to an inch and even deeper, so small grains and peas in particular can definitely be planted an inch, an inch and a half, even two inches. So be thinking about that, especially in regards to soil moisture. Um, the brassicas and annual ryegrass, they're smaller seeds, and, and many of the other legumes, like crimson clover as an example, um, those need to be planted more shallow, and a half inch, um, even to a quarter, um, is, is good for those. But again, you know, we have to consider soil moisture at this point. So if it's been really dry, those may not be species that you want to plant. All right, let's talk about fertility. These are crops that require nutrition. They don't require as much nutrition um, as a full season perennial forage or corn crop. You know, you're only expecting to get a graze off from these, maybe two. So they need low levels of nitrogen, you know, usually about 50 pounds is plenty. Um, but again, it depends on the fertility level of the field that you're going into. But generally, you know, a coating of manure uh, should be plenty to be able to grow this crop. And, you know, your phosphorus and potassium requirements are somewhat similar to um, uh, perennial forage as well. So they do need fertility, low levels of nitrogen, because you're only going to graze them once, maybe twice. Uh, and again, the pH, I'll lastly state, is really important. These are grasses and legumes, so we really need to make sure the pH is between 6 and 7. All right, so here's a pasture comparison from a farm here in Vermont with a mix of oats and peas versus perennial pasture at the same time of the year. So this was in August, or I'm sorry, October. Um, and you can see the crude protein level of the forage being grazed was extremely high, probably too high, compared to the perennial pasture. The digestibility um, was very high. The net energy of lactation also very high. So you can see that this can create a forage that has much higher quality than perennial forage in the fall. All right, so uh, just to revisit this, and I'm sure it's a little bit blurry, I took it out of our one of our research reports, 
But if you look over to the left of this graph, you can see Everleaf Oats was the highest yielding uh, cool season annual. And again, these were harvested in um, October, and this was in 2018. So you can see we were getting about a ton of dry matter. I would say the range for us usually is between a ton and two tons. So 2018 was a, a very cold fall, so we had lower productivity, but you can still see the oats out yielded, and really most anything with oats um, out yielded the other forage mixtures that we had in that year. If you look down to the bottom of the graph, you can see these are all the mixtures with winter grains. So as I mentioned, they have a lower fall yield compared to the spring grains that we're growing. But again, um, they're also meant to be there the following year. Okay, this is annual ryegrass. And I just wanted to note uh, variety selection is important. So I would encourage people to look at our, our test trials. You can see Kodiak annual ryegrass yielded much higher than some of the other ryegrasses. And so, you know, variety selection again, just with anything that we do is very important. And our team has been evaluating varieties for years, so you definitely can look on our website for that information. All right, so um, we don't have a whole lot of time left. And I just wanted to mention grazing winter triticale the following spring. So I have a number of farmers that will mix oats and peas and triticale together, winter triticale, and they'll get um, a light fall graze, and then they'll also get, hopefully, again, if there's not a lot of damage in the fall, they'll get a spring graze of the triticale that grows back, and here's just some yield and quality data from that. Considering that our stored feed might be low this year, Having this out in the field next spring um, might be very useful for people. Generally, we see that um, the winter cereal pasture yields higher um, than the cool season pasture first thing in the season. And usually, again, depending on the weather, we can usually get the cows out to pasture about a week, sometimes two weeks earlier if there is um, a winter cereal grain to graze, okay? So let's um, talk about brassicas a little bit. We've been doing a lot of work with these brassicas. They are very high quality, as people know. They don't produce a lot of dry matter, um, anywhere from 1,000 to, I would say, generally around a ton of dry matter um, in October and November. I think brassicas generally work best in mixtures because they can have some, you know, negative impacts um, on grazing ruminants, sheep, beef, and dairy. Um, and we do know that if um, they are grazed as the only part of an animal's diet, which I would do not recommend, um, you know, there is reduced intake. There can be some other health issues, um, especially with sheep, um, but also this has been seen in other livestock as well. So again, they're really digestible. They also have um, what I would call secondary, you know, compounds in them, <coughs> such as uh, glucosinolates, that when they're broken down in the rumen, they can have some negative effects. <laughs> um, and so you just need to be cautious. And like I said, they're, they're generally um, should be included as part of a diet, not as a whole diet. They can increase milk production. That has been documented, but again, as part of a diet to supplement, not as a whole diet, okay? All right, so false seeded brassicas, same thing. We want these brassicas seeded right about now, so mid-August to end of August. Seeding rates are usually about five, up to 10 pounds per acre. It doesn't take much seed um, to get a good stand. Um, 
usually if they're planted in mid-August, about 30 to, again, 40 days later, you'll have about a foot of growth. But um, you'll have more growth if you wait into the middle of October to graze. Again, depending on your management, there is an opportunity for these to regrow and get a couple of grazings, but it really depends on the weather um, and how much the animals kind of muck it up the first time they go through. There are lots of choices for forage brassicas. Um, there's, you know, kales and turnips and radishes. Uh, there is productivity differences and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, this again is just to show you the planning date differences. I generally try to get our brassicas in by mid-August. We get the highest yields and quality. We can't wait until September. It just really severely reduces yields. So now is the time. These are the different varieties of, of brassicas and their yields, so they do differ. Um, all of our project reports are on our website, and maybe we can type the website in the chat box. I mean, I probably have about 10 years of brassica data that you could you know, go through and, and look. They don't change all that often, the varieties, so you can find one that's suited um, you know, to your situation. So again, here's some of our data. Here's turnips. You can see how they yield. Uh, Barkant and apen turnips seem to yield the highest with uh, rape. Barsica seems to yield much higher than the standard dwarf Essex rape. And then we have a couple of tillage, ra uh, a tillage radish in here and a hybrid T raptor that has also done really well. Um, the protein content also differs but tends to be really high. All right, I know we're running out of time. I'm gonna wrap up just talking about a couple of cropping systems that growers are using in our area. So many of our growers are taking a first or second cut of perennial forage. Um, and usually this is um, you know, at the end of June, beginning of July. And that's when they're planting their warm season annual so they go in and actually no-till into that and then they can graze that annual about three times and they either leave the residue um, for the winter and then they plan to reseed that field the next spring um, or after the annual they go in and seed um, small grains for a winter cover crop so they'll either seed the triticale alone in that field and have a graze the next spring before reseeding. Um, so they get some early feed. But in the worst case scenario, they have a green manure, not really a green manure, but a cover crop um, that they can incorporate into the ground before they reseed. And then we have some farmers, again, like I mentioned, that mix the spring and winter cereals. So mix oats and triticale, plant those in midsummer, middle of August, right about now. Um, they seed at about 100 to 150 pounds per acre. Um, and they pl they're planting these two crops, one for fall grazing and hopefully one for spring grazing. And um, the cows, according to this farmer, milk like crazy when they're um, eating those oats. So just uh, some seed costs to consider. They can be expensive to plant. Um, and so, you know, and then you have tillage and everything else to consider. So it isn't a fit on all farms, but it definitely can be a huge benefit uh, for those where it fits. So I will end on that and turn it back over to Sam and see if we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, we definitely have time for questions. Um, so I am going to, uh, let me see, we have two in the chat box already. Let's see, I think one you might have already answered. Uh, okay, our first question is from Carol. Any experience with Bursine Clover? Ah, yes. So. I have tried the <laughs> bursting clover a number of times. Um, 
and I've, I've been able to establish it su somewhat successfully as a cover crop, but I haven't, um, I have not used it in a mixture with grazing at all. Um, I, I personally didn't find it that easy to establish. Um, I don't know, Sam, have you, have you done much work with it? No, we, that, that hasn't been something that we have tinkered with. Okay. Yeah. I, I, like I said, um, it seems to be the buzz a little bit and, um, we have tried, we've actually tried to mix it as well with summer annuals, um, because it is considered, you know, a summer legume and we haven't been that successful there either. All right. Uh, next question is, um, and I think you answered this at the end of your presentation, but Heather, after grazing your winter cereal grain in spring, when and what would you recommend or see for a planting after this? Yeah. So I think the nice thing, um, at least some of the farmers that I've worked with find that these annuals really help them in their rotations. And especially, and when I say rotation, these farmers aren't, they're not growing corn, like for corn silage or soybeans or anything else, they're mostly growing perennial forages. And they're using these annuals to basically um, rotate into before they reseed the perennial forage. And it really helps to, you know, break up the sod a bit. Um, and then these, these annuals, especially the summer annuals, take a lot of nitrogen. And so it helps to also supply nitrogen to the annuals. So in the couple of systems that I was talking about, that's exactly what this farmer was doing. They were using the warm season annuals followed by the cool season annuals to prep the ground um, for a new seeding the next spring. And so that, you know, in this case, the new seeding for that farmer was generally a mixture of you know, orchard grass and meadow fescues and uh, white and red clover. Now, theoretically, you could go into a summer annual again. So, you know, I think everybody knows that um, doing a new forage seeding is super stressful. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, it seems so variable. Like, is it going to take? Is it not? It, it all feels really risky. And it's always, um, you know, dependent on the year. And so I think you have that little bit of flexibility here too, where if, you know, you felt like, oh, this, you know, the spring hasn't been really great, I'm not able to get my new seeding in, then you could go from these cool season forage into a summer annual again. And, you know, you could, if the ground again wasn't too mucked up, you, you could go in and, you know, no-till in, into that stand. Um, and just to keep talking more about it <laughs> is one thing that I feel we have struggled with is no tilling, um, the warm season annuals. And I don't know if anybody on the call or, or Sam, if you folks have had much luck with that, but every time we've tried to no till the warm season annuals, whether it's millet or sedan grass or sorghum, they just, they just haven't done that well. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it, I feel like it's that has been challenging for us. Yeah, we always drill ours, um, and it's I, I don't want to say it's variable because I think warm season annuals are are fantastic, but the the no till for us we haven't figured it out yet. I'm I'm not convinced it's their problem and not ours. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think we're still trying to figure out there's gotta be something that we're doing wrong, it feels like. It it tends to seem like the, the previous weed suppression is the problem. Um, yeah. For us. It definitely seems challenging and I guess, you know, uh, if so many people don't wanna, you know, often they're growing perennial forages just because they don't want to till. Um, or they can't, right? It's like super rocky or maybe they don't even have the equipment anymore. So it just becomes challenging and people are always looking for ways to maybe no-till seed. Um, so, you know, I guess we need to work it out and figure it out, but it, it has been a challenge, I would say. The, the, the cool season annuals seem to no-till better. 
I don't know why, but we seem to have better luck with those. Definitely. That, well, that'll be the good uh, next project for Sarah. Yeah. We'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so another, this is a great question. Are you using grain oats or forage oats for fall? Yeah, we're definitely using forage oats, and I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, so we we have used Everleaf oats for years. Um, I'm sure there are other forage oat varieties, but they're leafier. They stay vegetative for longer periods of time, and you know the for they are bred for forage quality. So I don't, you know, I also. Um, feel like, and again, I don't have any scientific evidence to prove this, but they seem to have less rust. And rust can be a huge issue in grain oats. Um, and then, of course, I've also seen grain oats seed out in the fall. <laughs> so, you know, I think you want something that's going to stay in that vegetative state. You want that, you know, leafy forage to graze. So I would definitely recommend forage oats. Great. So this next question, it made me chuckle a little bit because it makes me think of some some unintentional overwintering that we've had. But the question <laughs> is, are there brassicas that will overwinter? Yeah, I I feel like yes, but doesn't always seem to be reliable if you want them to overwinter. And um, if you don't want them to overwinter, they might. And And I think this probably happens to you Sam, more a little bit south than to us. What what's your experience? Um, well, we've we've had some turnips and and rape over winter, um, and then they were actually a little bit of a bear the next spring to get rid of. But and it, it hadn't been our intention. It was it was sort of a surprise. Um, I, I do think that it, I think it was a warmer winter. You know, we didn't really have hard frost set in until December, so it was sort of a, a perfect storm. I wouldn't say it's common, but I wouldn't say it's out of the question. But I would echo what you're saying. If you want them to, they might not. If you don't want them to, they might. Yeah. So I think it's interesting because I know you know out in Oregon, um, and also you know you see this a lot in. Um, maybe England too as well, but you know, they'll grow, they're growing, growing winter canola and they graze the winter canola off in the, in the fall, in the winter when it's dormant. Um, and then the next spring, you know, it regrows and then, you know, shoots a seed head and they harvest the canola. So winter canola here um, is that, you know, we haven't tried to utilize it in that way, but we also see um, vari variation in whether or not it overwinters. It's it's pretty variable, um, even winter canola that's bred to overwinter. So I don't know, not reliable, I would say. Yeah, but don't be surprised if it happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so uh, just a quick comment that, um, Burseem clover did work well in our area with summer annual grass in Canada. So that. Oh, yeah. Well, I would like to, what, um, it would be great. Uh, what's the mixture that they're using? Because I think our issue that we ran into was that the, um, there's some trade offs there, right? So the summer annuals can be very aggressive, or they are very aggressive generally. Um, especially like Sudan grass um, and the uh, sorghums, and they get really tall. And um, so if we reduce the seeding rate of the annual grass, then we were significantly reducing yields to accommodate for the legume. So, I, you know, there's a pretty big trade-off um, so I, I know that it could probably work, but how, you know, I guess it really depends on the farm goals and what you're after in terms of feed, um, biomass, you know, all those kind of things. Um, so I would be curious, the, the seeding rate, the mixture, I imagine it was pretty low grass. Um, we're used to seeding like 50 or 60 pounds of those annuals, so it must be around 20, 15 or 20. I don't know. Well, they they just followed up, Patrice here has followed up and told us uh, Sudan grass or sorghum Sudan with Bursim, 15 pounds grass, 15 pounds clover, two yeah. cups 
two to three tons dry matter when well managed. Yep. Great. That sounds, yeah. Patrice, send us to your website. (laughs) We want to, we want to see your study. (laughs) Um, So, uh, okay. The next question here, let's see. Okay. Um, This is, this is a tricky one. So I would like to add a high tannin plant for grazing to my current field. Are there any other plant breeds besides Cerecia lespediza? I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if I'm saying that right. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so if they're talking about annuals, um, well, chicory has high tannins. It's not an annual, but it's, I think, a biennial. Um, there is, and I guess all the tannins are really different in these plants, so I, I'm not sure exactly, is it I'm sure, like a parasite control or something? I'm not sure what they're using it for. Um, but you know, the old standard, and it's not an annual, is bird's foot trefoil, which is very high in tannins um, and has actually a lot of documented uses um, as well. But those are a couple that I'm I'm thinking of. We haven't really done a lot of work on the secondary metabolites of these plants, although we have a lot of interest in it. And part of that has to do with the fact that we know they suppress potentially suppress methane emissions from animals. Um, But with that, there may be other negative impacts as well that we don't know about. And Patrice is on the call, so he may also have some suggestions. I work with Patrice up here, so he's a a nutritionist in um, Quebec. Um, And yeah, and the person did follow up and they said, yes, it was for parasite control was their interest. Yeah. I wonder how bird's foot trefoil would work. It's not, you know, it has to be grazed carefully, uh, mostly because it, you know, it's regrowth. Um, it can be overgrazed or else it won't regrow, but, you know, that might be another one to try. Um, yeah. Great. And I think we're just about at time. So I'm going to give people a chance to collect their thoughts in the case they have any questions left. Um, Heather, there was one interesting pre-question we got, which was about, um, is there any reason that you might want to, oh, and just so you know, we can still see your screen. Um, And uh, it was, um, is there any reason that you might want to let your brassicas go to seed intentionally? I don't, you know, I don't think um, brassicas necessarily no, <laughs> I'm like thinking of every farmer saying, oh, my gosh, no. Know. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I think this has been brought up quite a bit about letting plants go to flower. And, um, you know, especially like clovers and, um, you know, alfalfa, things to basically reseed themselves out in, out in your pastures. Um, but, no, I... I I would personally not want my brassicas to go to seed, but somebody else might. I think it's probably a personal, personal uh, choice. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's how you get your, your brassicas to come back next year. Um, okay. Well, uh, with that, it looks like we have hit all of the questions and we are just about at time. So I'm going to go ahead and say, Heather, thank you so very much for being our presenter today. Uh, For those of you with friends that were interested, we always get a million emails saying, was it recorded? And yes, it is recorded. Uh, You'll get the link in your follow-up email and uh, it will be on our website sometime next week. So thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you again to Heather for being our presenter. And when you exit the webinar today, you will be prompted to take a survey. Uh, If you could do that quickly, we would really appreciate it.